The sun had already begun to dip toward the horizon, painting the cliffs above the Dead Sea in a fierce glow of copper and gold. A boy, skin tan from the desert winds, his hands rough from herding, wandered anxiously along the rocky slopes. One of his goats had strayed, and in the harsh quiet of the afternoon, every bleat echoed like a cry for help. Frustrated, the boy picked up a stone and hurled it into a dark cave mouth, hoping the noise would flush out his animal. Instead, what answered was not the rush of hooves, but a sharp, brittle crack, the unmistakable sound of pottery breaking after centuries of silence. The boy froze. Something ancient had awakened. Within days, he and his companions returned, lamps flickering against the cave walls. Their eyes widened as shadows revealed rows of clay jars. Some sealed, some broken, their contents spilling forth. Inside lay rolled skins, stiff with age, ink faded, but still legible. They could not know it then, but in their hands rested words that had slept for 2,000 years. Scriptures, laws, hymns, visions. What the world would later call the Dead Sea Scrolls. What began in that accidental moment grew into one of the greatest archaeological mysteries of the 20th century. Cave after cave, 11 in all, yielded fragments of manuscripts. They were not pristine books, but broken whispers. Over 25,000 scraps, some no larger than a fingernail. Scholars bent over tables for decades, piecing them together like a puzzle with more missing than complete. Some fragments sang of prophets long known. The Hebrew Bible, preserved in its oldest surviving form. Others introduced voices never heard before. Sectarian rules, mystical songs, philosophical debates. They were windows into a turbulent age, when Judaism was reshaping itself under Greek influence and Christianity had only begun to stir. But whose voices were these? Were they the words of a single desert brotherhood, an isolated sect writing for themselves alone? Or were they the scattered treasures of many communities across Judea, collected in one secret library? The question lingered, unresolved, through decades of debate. The answer, curiously, was not written in ink but in flesh. Every scroll, whether scripture or song, had been written on parchment, animal skin treated until it could hold the permanence of words. To a molecular biologist, each strip of parchment was more than a page. It was a body's ghost, carrying within it the DNA of the creature it once was. But could that ghost still speak after 2,000 years? Ancient DNA is fragile, shattered by time, warped by heat, blurred by the careless touch of modern hands. To recover it required a kind of scientific priesthood. Airlocks, sterilized chambers, bathed in ultraviolet light. Conservators working with brushes fine enough to move dust without harming the ink. Tiny particles, mere motes from the blank edges of parchment, were taken and prepared. A method known as silica extraction drew out the genetic code like a magnet, pulling iron filings from sand. Slowly, the voices of the animals emerged, hidden beneath the voices of the scribes, sheep, goat, and, astonishingly, cow. Of 26 scroll fragments examined, 24 came from sheep. That was expected. Sheep and goats thrived in the arid cliffs of Qumran, where the scrolls had been hidden. But two fragments, both from the book of Jeremiah, were not. They were written on cowhide. It was a revelation that struck scholars like thunder. The desert around Qumran could never have supported cattle. Too dry, too barren, too merciless. There was no trace of corrals or processing hides. Yet here were cow parchments as real as the dust of the caves. The conclusion was undeniable. These scrolls had come from elsewhere, perhaps from the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley, where water and pasture abounded. They were not born in the solitude of Qumran, but carried there, part of a broader web of exchange. The idea that Qumran had been a cloistered community, writing only for itself, began to crack. Instead, the image of a library took form, an intellectual crossroads where texts of many origins were gathered, studied, and preserved. Among the thousands of fragments, one text drew particular fascination, the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice. It was no law, no narrative, but a liturgy, an attempt to summon the language of heaven itself, describing the worship of angels in radiant detail. Copies of this mystical work were found in several Qumran caves, suggesting its central role in the community. But another copy appeared 50 kilometers to the south, within the fortress of Masada, where Jewish rebels once made their final stand against Rome. Whose song was it? Did it belong to the desert sect, spreading with its members to distant places? 
or had it been cherished by multiple Jewish groups and anthems shared across the land. Here, once again, DNA gave its verdict. The Qumran copies were written on skins from sheep belonging to the same maternal line, a genetic family of animals suggesting a single flock, a single community of scribes. The Masada fragment, however, came from a sheep of a different lineage altogether. The message was clear. Masada's copy had not traveled from Qumran. It had been made independently. The songs of the Sabbath sacrifice were no private treasure. They resonated across Judea, sung in multiple voices, beloved by more than one sect. Not every fragment nestled comfortably within the Qumran puzzle. Some were like strangers at a family gathering. They looked similar, yet something about them seemed out of place. One such oddity was a small piece cataloged as 4Q344. Unlike the sacred hymns and laws around it, this was a mundane document, a record of a financial debt. Its script was later in style, its content more practical than spiritual. Scholars had long whispered doubts. Perhaps it had wandered into the Qumran collection by mistake, sold among genuine pieces when antiquities dealers scattered treasures onto the market in the mid-20th century. When the scientists read its DNA, the parchment spoke the truth. The sheep from which it was made bore no genetic kinship to Qumran's flocks. It was an outlier, its origins lying elsewhere in the Judean desert, where such everyday records were common. For the first time, there was physical proof that not all scrolls attributed to Qumran had truly belonged there. Another fragment, this one from the revered book of Isaiah, told a similar tale. Though venerated by generations, its genetic signature marked it as foreign. Somewhere, Hidden in the sand of Judea, other communities had written and preserved their own sacred texts. By chance or by trade, those texts had become tangled in the Qumran story. The scrolls were no longer the voice of one people alone, they were a chorus. For decades, historians had argued in seminar halls and over desert excavation pits. Were the scrolls the guarded writings of one isolated sect, perhaps the Essenes, or were they a mosaic of many traditions gathered under one roof? Ink could not answer the question, nor could handwriting, nor style, but the ghostly fingerprints of animals, the hidden DNA within parchment, finally tipped the scales. Sheep from one valley, cows from another, scrolls written by separate communities yet preserved in the same caves, the evidence was irrefutable. The Dead Sea Scrolls were not the legacy of a single cloister, they were a tapestry woven from diverse hands across Judea during the turbulent centuries when Greek and Roman shadows fell upon the land. Some were indeed born in Qumran, written by scribes who drew from their own herds, but others journeyed from fertile valleys, mountain fortresses, distant settlements. Together they formed a library greater than any one community could have built. Picture it now, not as a monastery, but as a meeting place. The caves above the Dead Sea, Harsh, sun-scorched, silent, holding within them scrolls from every corner of the land. Words of prophets, songs of angels, laws and debates, practical records of debt. A collection both sacred and ordinary, reflecting the full breadth of human life 2,000 years ago. Each fragment, no matter how small, carried more than ink. It carried a living history. The skin of an animal, the hand of a scribe, the mind of a community, the faith of an age. And when modern scholars place those fragments beneath microscopes in laboratories bathed in sterile light, the past revealed itself not through ink alone but through bloodlines of sheep and cattle. The very creatures of the ancient Near East became silent witnesses, their DNA bridging centuries, settling disputes, rewriting history. The discovery reshaped the way we see Qumran. No longer a lonely sect whispering only to itself, but a hub of exchange, a crossroads where diverse voices converged, preserved in jars for a future they could never imagine. Yet even now, the story is incomplete. Thousands of fragments remain unsolved, many too tiny to place with certainty. Some carry genetic secrets still waiting to be read. Others may yet prove to come from unknown sites, forgotten communities, lost libraries. The Dead Sea Scrolls remind us of something profound. History is rarely written by one hand alone. It is a weaving of many voices, many lives, many choices, sacred and mundane, lofty and practical, all entangled in the vast fabric of human memory. When the shepherd boy hurled his stone into the cave in 1947, he did more than startle an ancient jar. He broke open a silence two millennia long, 
releasing not one story, but thousands. And even now, under the watchful cliffs and the unyielding sun of the desert, those voices still murmur, waiting for us to listen. The story of the Dead Sea Scrolls is not finished. It is still being written, piece by piece, fragment by fragment, as science and history join hands to recover the song of an ancient world.